Hello, mostly ladies and possibly a few men if you are listening to this episode. Today, this is, of course, Anna Laura Brown, host of the Auto Rehab Podcast, where, as always, you can download and listen to all the episodes and get show notes online at autoimmunerehab.com or by searching Autoimmune Rehab wherever you get podcasts. Today, we have a special episode because I am glad to have a man on the podcast to share his autoimmune story with us. Usually, we feature a lot of women because there have a tendency to be a lot more women that have autoimmune conditions. But today we have Ryan Surly here, and I actually met Ryan in person originally. So this is another one of those episodes with somebody that I actually know kind of, well, we're getting to know each other, I guess you could say. So Ryan, why don't you start off by sharing with us a little bit about who you are and your story a little bit to get started with. Sure. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm from Utah. I've lived my, most of my whole life here in the Salt Lake area. I started in Murray and then grew up in Ogden. Still live there, but I'm now working back down here and life is, <clears throat> life is taking me back to Salt Lake, but I'm, um, married and have two little kids and uh I work in finance um I have always been a person that just loves the outdoors and moving and sports and exercise in every every form and that is what led me to discover my uh autoimmune condition so that's just a part of who I am and um yeah celiac disease kind of interfered with that and I, it's been a long journey trying to figure out figure out how to live with it the best I can <clears throat> yeah for sure absolutely celiac can be a tough one and yet an easy one at the same time because it's a little bit easier to diagnose than some and the supposed you know way to avoid having a flare-up is in theory easier but that's just literally in theory, as I'm sure you've discovered, just because even though yeah. theoretically they say just don't eat gluten, well, that can be a little bit more complicated than just saying don't do it. It's one of those things that saying it is a little easier than actually doing it, as I'm sure you've well discovered. So tell us a little bit about your journey to actually get a diagnosis. How did you find out you had it? What was that process like? Well... Early in my life, I it can actually I I believe it can be traced back to um infancy. I I, I was you know my, my parents and family always told me I was I was a colicky baby, so I just always had always had issues from a young age. And in, in my like adolescent years, it started to turn from just like it, you know, some indigestion that, that would happen here and there into like a recurring inexplicable sickness that would it, it would come up anytime we ate certain foods or went to a certain restaurant but there was not a there wasn't a pattern that anyone noticed um as an example i i, I have a mem memory of going to the old spaghetti factory for someone's birthday I think I was like eight years old. And then the moment we walked in the door and I smelled the food, that's a place I used to love to eat. But that, that day I walked in the door and I smelled the food and, and immediately I darted to the bathroom. It was like everything, my whole digestive tract was just setting off alarms. And um, I won't get, I won't get too graphic. You know, you know, the implications that that a, a digestive disorder like celiac disease can have, but um, so I don't need to explain those in detail, but that day it was just nothing happened particularly. I just went in the bathroom and felt sick and, it, you know, went home. I didn't, I didn't eat. I couldn't, I couldn't get any food down, went home and moved on. And my doctors at that age, just told they all just said it's IBS. It's it's just IBS. Take some Tums or Pepto Bismol, and um, so I continued on like that. 
no idea that there was a, a, a deeper problem until <clears throat> in junior high, I started to run track. And that's that's when I got into like pushing the limits of my my fitness. So I started, I realized it was like the one sport I, I could actually be good at because you didn't have to be too coordinated or anything like that. And I I loved it. So I just went crazy. I, I started running in my in my free time and, and eventually got to be a pretty decent runner. But again, just depending on the, the day and 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 this the circumstances, I never noticed a pattern, but I would, some some things would cause me digestive issues. So I go out for a run and and a few minutes in I just would feel like intense burning in my intestines and i i pushed through it until about my junior year of high school when it got really really severe the the pain had you know the the pain would at at its worst get to the point where i couldn't stand up straight and walk i would have to like hunch over just just to bear through it and i'd leave practice early on a pretty pretty regular basis and that pain would last for several hours after a you know bout of running. So I went to see a specialist. Um, don't really remember what they did. No, no scopes or anything yet. They may have de- they may have done like a, a blood test or something along those lines. And again, they told me you have IBS. And we we wanted to get this resolved before I left on my mission because I was, you know, I was getting ready to go at, at 18 years old. And um, we saw that, uh, oh, what's it called? Gastroenterologist. Got the same answer as every doctor had given me before, but he gave me a medication that I think was a, a antipsychotic drug. So it was like meant to numb the the um or like calm the the central nervous system and, and like re- just relieve the pain in my digestive tract um it didn't work at all and I noticed absolutely no no improvement or or um, negative effects but it didn't resolve anything yeah that's kind of so, crazy because you're not the first person that I've talked to that has told me that they initially got given some sort of psychotic drug for an autoimmune condition and it's like hello that's not going to solve the problem <laughs> yeah isn't that wild it's totally I, wild <laughs> it boggles my mind to this day i i had met a handful of people actually one of my one of my really good friends from my my childhood had celiac disease and his he had a couple little sisters that had it as well so i knew it existed i i had heard of it and i had seen like at, at church they had you know in the sacrament tray they had a little cup with like a rice cake in it and it was wrapped in saran wrap to keep it from from cross-contaminating that I didn't know I didn't have any any deeper understanding of of what that meant but my gastroenterologist I apparently didn't think to check for that nor did anybody else That's really weird because they're usually the ones that do the scopes for celiac disease too so it's pretty strange. It is weird. <laughs> yeah, it was frustrating. So I went, I, I left on my mission. I went to Tennessee and I was there for a couple of years and I had my fair share of problems that I think any, anybody that does that runs into those, you know, into similar problems when you, when you shift your diet drastically and it's really inconsistent and you're kind of at the mercy of what other people decide to, to give you. Um, so the same problems continued, but I had some new symptoms that were introduced. Like I, I had a couple instances where I ate really the food and the food in the South is just always heavier and, and more fatty and, and greasy. And I had a few instances where I ate like a super, super excessive amount of dairy with a meal. Um, it's really gross to think about it now. <laughs> just <laughs> Tasted good, but just just dis- disgusting amounts of of uh, dairy and saturated fat and whatnot. 
And then I would have, you know, really intense after effects for, for several hours or sometimes a couple days. That led me to believe for a while that I was lactose intolerant, which I'm not. But I went for about a year with no dairy. And I felt somewhat better. Oddly enough, my allergies improved during that time. I just didn't have as, as much of the hay fever seasonal allergies. Um, but it didn't, it didn't really change my digestive symptoms. So finished my mission and, and I came home and I went to see a personal trainer. We, we have a really good friend that does business with my parents who runs a personal training gym. And he, he you know, he knows that I, I, he, he knew that I was into running and, and I wanted to like, I wanted to train for a marathon and, and, um, get stronger and whatnot. And he just invited me to come to his gym and I started training with him. And that whole story came up in conversation and he had, he, he looked at me one time and he, he just looked like he was mulling over what I told him in his mind and, and calculating it. And he's like, he, he said, have you ever tried going grain free? And I was like, no, that sounds, that sounds horrible. Like no, no bread or rice or corn or anything. And he's like, yeah, you should try it. Um, especially gluten. You should just try going grain free and make sure you don't eat any gluten for a while and see what happens. And he did, I don't even think he mentioned celiac disease at the time, but I, I did, I was willing to try anything because I I'd had, you know, really some intense pain for several years by that time. So I went home and um, made a shopping list and ran to the store and bought a whole, you know, load of, of groceries with no grain, no gluten or anything. Um, there was probably some gluten hidden, hidden in some things I bought that I, I just didn't know, but yeah, for um, sure. yeah. but for a couple of, I was like stocked up on food that was at least mostly grain free. So I ate like that for a couple of weeks and it was like an immediate, like a light switch had flipped and my symptoms were just not gone, but so much less so much less intense and frequent and um i slept better and i didn't feel as tired all the time and i recover better that was an interesting one i recovered from my workouts faster um so i told my trainer this and we started talking about it and the you know, conversation opened back up and he mentioned something about celiac disease and i, I started to research it and i was like oh my gosh I must have this. I've been eating plenty of gluten my whole life and nobody's nobody has tested me for this, but the moment I stopped eating gluten, I felt better immediately. So I just kind of self-diagnosed myself. I, that was redundant. I diagnosed myself with celiac <laughs> disease. Yeah. Um, and for about a year, I at least attempted, I did my best at eating gluten-free. Um, I alluded to this before, but there were many, many places I was being exposed every day, unknowingly. But I, I wasn't eating, you know, the huge amounts of the, the bread and pizza and um, buns and things like that, where it's just huge amounts all at once. And my situation improved a lot. Um, over the next couple of years, I was in, so at this point in my life, I was in my undergrad at Weber State and I was, um, pursuing, I think I had decided I was going to go to physical therapy school by then. I was working in nursing homes to get some patient hours and, um, About a year later, I started dating my wife. So I, I had a lot. I was just doing the young adult things and, and had just put a lot of pressure on myself. And I think 
all the all the responsibilities and obligations I just heaped upon myself and I, I you know I have huge expectations of myself it created a ton of stress and I don't know the physiology behind this but I think that exacerbated my autoimmune condition um probably has a lot to do with inflammation Oh, for sure. The, Absolutely. They've done studies that have said this stress and inflammation definitely makes autoimmune conditions worse for sure. Yeah. 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 I thought so intuitively it makes sense. Um, and I was like stressed to the max. That was like my, uh, that was a learning experience for me. I hit, I, I hit rock bottom and I, one day I, I realized I'm not Superman. I couldn't handle everything I had taken on my shoulders so I had to let a lot of it go but as a byproduct of that my symptoms came back with a vengeance and like a few months leading up to um my engagement when I, when I proposed to my wife I started to have this weird pattern of having a ferocious appetite for a few weeks and then losing my appetite completely so i would eat like a horse i just just crazy amounts of food i think i counted for a while it was like four to five thousand calories a day whoa <laughs> yeah that's a lot <laughs> yeah it was crazy and and then that would last for a few weeks and i just couldn't be i was never satisfied and then i then something would switch and and i was never hungry and I would eat probably no more than 2000 calories in a day, usually more like, a, you know, I'd eat like one meal a day, a lot of times that would last for a couple of weeks. And then it would go right back to just eating like a horse. And along with that, my digestive system, my, my digestive symptoms progressively got worse over a few months. So I proposed to my wife in December of 2017. And our wedding date was May uh, 12th of 2018. And over that, like, five months or so, I had I had several... I, I must have just had small exposures to gluten, and I, I, it would be, like, debilitating for a couple of days. I, I missed a lot of work. Um, I missed school, and I would just stay, stay home and... and try to find any any sort of relief i was usually laying on laying on my laying on one side would kind of make the pain subside for a few minutes and I'd come back and i'd flip over and lay on the other side but it was like it, it was brutal it sucked and um i went to a, a family party at my grandparents house just like two weeks before the wedding, someone had made um, grilled pineapple. And that's one of my, I love pineapple. I love fruit. And I saw that I, I, my, I had no appetite and I had just my, my insides had just felt like they had been ravaged, but I saw that pineapple. I was like, that sounds so good. I'm so I, like my, my system is empty. It feels like I need to put something in my stomach. And that's, you know, it's just fruit. Like it couldn't, that can't hurt me in any way. <laughs> so I thought, so I ate a few pieces of this grilled pineapple and not 15 minutes later, I was bent over a, a toilet and praying that it would all come out and the pain would go away. And, um, I had no such luck. So I, I asked my mom to take me to the urgent care. She, she ran me over to this urgent care. And, um, it's all a blur in my head. I only remember vague details. I, I remember that they checked for like ulcers and um, appendicitis and something else. At that urgent care, they gave me this cocktail of stuff. It, see, it I remember just tasting like Pepto Bismol, but it was like they they said it, they called it a cocktail, and it was supposed to rule out a few different things. And I drank it and it was gross and it made my stomach hurt worse. And they're like, we can't help you. That's, that was the, the consensus is we can't help you. You need to go to the ER. Um, I think they, I think 
they were suspecting my appendix was going to burst or something. Oh, yeah. Possibly, so, yeah. Yeah. So I got rushed to the ER and um, on the drive there, the, the pain kind of subsided. But they, they took me back inside. And when I got out of the car, the movement like brought it right back and it was just just as intense as before so they they put me on a bed and they gave me an iv and they they gave me that um I, i'm not sure if it was the same medicine but it was an antipsychotic, and it had an adverse reaction so it made me feel like super paranoid and and um i, I thought i was going to be like trapped in the hospital forever i, I was just, just kind of tripping out and they just they ended up deciding to put me out because I, I think they they felt bad and that the, they had um th there was an adverse reaction I was just not not feeling good so they they put me under and they decided to do an endoscopy and um took a biopsy and confirmed it was celiac disease and and um they sent me to a new gastroenterologist he he put me through like a, a he has like a training program on on re reconstructing your diet and reading labels and stuff so he put me through this i had to do this like course that he made to to learn how to really eat gluten free um and since then it's it hasn't been like smooth sailing but it's been progressive um gradual but but constant improvement yeah so it's been that's like, good i think i think it's five yeah five years now since i've been officially diagnosed yeah does it make you kind of mad or irritated that the original gastroenterologist and some of these other doctors didn't catch it sooner <laughs> I'm over it. I spent a while being ticked about that. Yeah. A long time. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah. Now. You eventually have to get over it, of course. But, you know, I mean, it definitely <laughs> is it's frustrating because it's like, really, it's celiac. You wouldn't think it would be as big a deal as, say, like, took me probably at least five years to get a Hashimoto's diagnosis. You would think that they would catch on to celiac wow. quicker. But, you know. Yeah. And it was becoming more, you know, like gluten free stuff was becoming more a little more popular back then. People were going gluten free to to lose yeah. weight and things like that. So it was kind of trendy. And I, I I don't know. I would like to get in their heads and figure out where you know how they missed that. But I, that's never going to happen. So. Yeah, it's kind of crazy, too, because I know going gluten-free is often recommended for IBS as well. So just the very fact that they would tell you you had IBS and then not even mention trying gluten-free is kind of crazy to me, too. But, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's all, it's all strange. Yeah, and like you said, and I think what you had told me previously, too, is you suspect that you may have family members that have it as well, but nobody's been officially diagnosed in your family. So it wasn't like you had parents or siblings or anybody that were already gluten-free or that already had celiac that could say, hey, maybe you should try this, you know? Yeah, I still, yeah, I, I have a suspicion that, I have a sneaking suspicion that I have several family members who who have it maybe not as severe as i do but i'm the only one that's been diagnosed and i think they have like observed i think they just have have this pretty conceived notion built up in their, their minds that it's like super inconvenient and totally disrupts your world so they don't i don't think they want to find out so nobody yeah. else has been tested or diagnosed or anything yeah, it's rough because, yeah, they're probably just in their mind's eye thinking, well, maybe it's not that big a deal, you know. I don't, if I get a diagnosis, then I know that I'll have to do this. It could be a pain, you know, that kind of stuff. But, I mean, yeah. where I come from, I feel like having a diagnosis is your first step and path to healing. And the, I've personally even heard some real horror stories that, if you go with celiac disease for too long and never get it diagnosed, even if you're 
not having major symptoms, it can even lead to things like cancer, I've heard in the past and stuff. If you continue to eat gluten and you don't pursue a diagnosis. So, I mean, I would say that's not the way you want to be living. But, you know, I mean, I guess to each his own. <laughs> yeah, to each their own. My, my, my GE, my current GE told me some stats about that. When, when he diagnosed me, it's, it's been a while now, but the risk for the risk for um, colon, pancreatic, liver, and stomach cancer are like, like exceptionally high in undiagnosed celiac disease cases and and still much higher than the general population in diagnosed, you know, the people that are, eating gluten-free is still much higher for all four types of cancers, but, um, it goes down a lot when you're diagnosed and, you know, cut it out of your diet. But, um, yeah, I've, I've definitely observed people think it's not as big of a deal as it really is. And they also think it's harder. They think it's, they think getting the diagnosis and changing your diet is much harder than than I believe it is. I feel, I'm curious how, how your experience was when you were diagnosed with Hashimoto's, but when, when I got the news, it was a huge relief. I felt, it felt like a weight was lifted off my shoulders because like there was an answer for all these things that had plagued me for my whole life. It made sense. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it was a huge relief to me, too. But at the same time, it was kind of a little bit trickier because, you know, it's depending on the perspective you're coming from, I finally got diagnosed by a natural path. And they were, I'd already been gluten free for five years then. And they said, you know, that was one of the first thing they said, if you're not already gluten free, you should get it out of your diet, but you are going to have to consider dairy, you're going to have to consider other kinds of inflammatory foods. It's, you know, supplementation, lots of different, it's Hashimoto's, it's way trickier, because it's not like you can just <laughs> give up the gluten, and there you go, <laughs> you know. But I know that, you know, especially with celiac disease, you have to really, really, I mean, I say I've been gluten-free for 10 years, but I'm sure there are times like eating out, things like that, I've probably still gotten it a little bit. And it probably hasn't had as big of an impact on me as it would on you being celiac, you know. And, of course, I'm sure you yeah. realize now when you look back to that whole thing with the pineapple, they probably had grilled some buns, hamburger buns or hot dog buns or something on the same grill as the pineapple. And that's probably what caused it, because they got some crumbs or something on your pineapple one. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I, I thought about that day because it was such an interesting. It's such an interesting deal. It's just some pineapple. So, that's uh, in my mind. That's one possibility, and the other is just that I had, you know, I've been so inflamed and. Um, the you know the the lining of of the the small intestine gets like worn down to it, it like breaks down the microvilli mm -hmm. and I, I just wonder if I had been, you know so much repeated exposure even just in the small doses and, and then the stress on top of it that that caused you know a ton of extra inflammation I wonder if the acidity of the pineapple in my empty stomach run, running through there is what what triggered it. Or both. I don't know. It's hard to say, yeah, for sure, but, you know. So, as far as what you do now today, do you have any gluten in your house at all, or do you just make everybody in your family go gluten-free so that you don't have to <laughs> worry about it in your house? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm a Nazi about that. <laughs> so, well, no, it, it's not, that's not really fair. What The way it happened is, um, you know, my, my wife was my fiance at the time, she was like there with me, um, through the diagnosis and it got kind of scary. And, um, and then we were married like immediately after. And she was as supportive as anyone could be. Um, so she learned how to make everything under the sun without gluten. But I think for like a year, of our of our marriage we 
Oh, yeah, here's an important detail. She was working at Jersey Mike's, which is a sub shop that is chock full of gluten. Oh, and yeah. <laughs> so she was eating it every day and she would she would bring home leftovers occasionally. And then she would like still cook certain things with gluten. And um, <clears throat> my, I think I was still just in the healing process. So, uh, you know, there's just a lot of damage that, that I don't know if it'll ever fully be reversed, but, but it, I was, I was not in good shape. So I, I think after about a year, she had finally quit working at Jersey Mike's, but I asked her, I was like, I, I don't think we can have it in the house anymore. Cause I think it's just the, just the tiny amounts that are on, you know, on the dishes and in, and in the sink and the dishwasher and the counters. Like, I, I don't think I can, I think it's going to be better for my health long-term if we just get it all out. And she did. So for the past four years, there's been um, zero in our house. And my, my, my mom got really good at cooking gluten-free. My mother-in-law is fantastic. She makes, we're, we're there at their house for dinner just about every other week. And when I'm there, everything is gluten-free. The whole, like, every part of the meal and she cleans everything beforehand. So I have like the best support system you could have. It's, it's pretty nice. It's, it's helped a lot. That's awesome. Yeah. And I think that's really key because otherwise it is, it's really tough to do it if you don't have that support system. And, you know, if people are not, they're really giving, you know, behind your back. So what other, tips or things would you say to somebody who is maybe they're just starting going gluten-free maybe they just got a diagnosis or you know maybe they've had it for a little while but they're still pretty struggling with it what other tips would you offer to them um one thing i would i would suggest is don't try to replace everything that you used to eat with like some kind of substitute um it helped me to just drop those things so for quite a while i didn't eat any bread and i didn't eat pizza or burgers or um donuts uh, you know it's a lot of the junk food that's not great for you anyway that you know um, I just cut it all out. I didn't do any of it. I, I, my diet mostly consisted of meat, fruit, vegetables, and um, and some like whole food carbs. So rice, potatoes, um, beans, corn, like like in the most natural forms. And then I that was when I made like the biggest strides and like the improvement of my symptoms. And I've, over time I've added back in, you know, I found some substitutes that I really like that are worth the ridiculous price you pay for them. And they, they, they taste better now that they've been developed for years. Um, but that made the transition that, that made like finding my way through daily life and going to restaurants and stuff much easier because I, I wouldn't try, I wouldn't get my hopes up and, and like have to, um, try all these things that I knew weren't going to taste the same. So just eating different foods is, I think is a, a good way to start. Um, so, so go with a lot of whole foods, less, less processed, just meat, fruit, vegetables, grains, um, and it's also really helpful to make the mental shift. This has, uh, you know, a psychological implications can depend on who the person is, but I've seen others around me that, that, you know, that have celiac disease who struggle to like stand up for themselves and people poke fun at them. You know, people make fun of me and I just... I don't care, uh, you know, because I, I, I know 
that my health and my well-being is worth to me it's worth far more than you know not inconveniencing people or not you know making a social situation awkward or having to you know really when you're when you're going to a restaurant you really got to dig and find out like if you, if it's safe for you or not and and i i'm at this point i have no problem going to a party and eating nothing um walking out of a restaurant i don't care anymore because it, it it's my my health and my that's all i have uh, so if those people that you know then then if they hear this they probably know who they are um if you worry about others before yourself it's going to be harder to recover and get your health back because you're going to you're going to let yourself get exposed to poison just just to you know stay comfortable it's it's worth being uncomfortable to to make sure you you really care for your body so do it for yourself to to make your life better and it it, it pays off big time in the end and I, I really think most people most people around me have been very accepting and they they you know realize it's not as it's not as big of a deal as it as 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 it's made out to be to just eat, eat a little bit different diet it doesn't really doesn't affect anyone around me anymore so i i just I do what works for me and, and my health is so much better for it. I think that's the best advice I can give to people who are struggling to, to keep the diet going is like, make it a priority to take care of yourself. That's awesome. I love that. Yeah. And like you said, just the eating the real whole foods. I mean, I think even people that aren't gluten free benefit from that advice. I mean, let's face yeah, it. True. I mean, just because it's gluten free doesn't mean it's healthy. There's a lot of gluten free stuff out there that really, when you look at the content and what's in it with the sugar and the processed stuff, some of that stuff is quite frankly worse for you than stuff with gluten <laughs> to some degree. I mean, oh, yeah. It's just so yeah. bad your health some of that amen. stuff is <laughs> yeah amen i think it's easier for the when the body's in healing mode especially when all that damage has been done to your digestive tract yeah. it's, it's easy for it to recover and get back to functioning normally when it's when you're feeding it just better quality simple stuff yeah and really quite frankly it's going to be cheaper too you know you think gluten free oh, yeah. is going to be expensive? What's expensive is all the gluten free replacements that aren't that great for you to begin with. So they are very expensive, and most most of them are not worth it. Yeah, absolutely awesome. Well, thanks for coming on and talking with us today. So I assume in the show notes we could, if if there's anybody, if you wanted to leave any kind of contact information, we can put that there. That. I don't know if you have any social media that you want anybody to pay attention to or anything like that, but we'll put whatever you decide to put in the show notes. And thanks for coming on and sharing with us. Any last words you want to leave? No, no. Thanks for having me. I, I love that you, I love that you do this and you give people a place to tell their story because that felt really good to tell you all that just now. So I hope it's helpful to someone out there that's listening. That, yeah, that really I'm fun. sure it absolutely will be. Thank you for taking the time to do it as well.